Welcome to part six of our eight part introduction to commercial real estate training series. Once again, I am your host, Lauren Keim, and we have covered a lot of material so far. So let's do a quick review. Over the last five sessions, we discussed the fundamentals of your commercial real estate practice, and that includes property types, that includes investment analysis, that includes data gathering techniques, it includes talking about commercial leases, and we even talked briefly about getting commercial mortgages and commercial financing. Today we're going to spend on the practice of your business, and we're going to start the practice session by talking about prospecting for commercial real estate business. In the interest of time, let me start by explaining that all real estate transactions, whether we're looking at residential or commercial, begin with a buyer and a seller, or a landlord and a tenant. And while it's true that commercial investment real estate involves far more mathematical calculations, projections, legal complications, and financing alternatives than its residential counterpart, the industry is not nearly as complex as agents think. Now, this is an overview of the real estate business broken down into a seller or owner side and into a buyer or tenant side. And there are three major components to each side. Let me explain. On the owner side of the transaction, you'll be working either with a property seller who wants to sell or a property landlord who wants to rent a property. On the seller side or the landlord side of the transaction, realtors have basically three jobs or three components to their job, including prospecting, presentation, and service. And all aspects of marketing and selling or leasing commercial or investment real estate falls into one of these three areas. On the buyer side or tenant side of the transaction, there are also three basic components, prospecting, presentation, and service. And we'll get to that in a minute. On the owner's side, again, whether you're working with sellers or landlords, you're going to prospect using the same method. In dissecting the seller side of the transaction, prospecting is the first job of any successful commercial realtor. And in fact, the number one reason that any real estate professional fails is failure to prospect for business. Prospecting for sellers or landlords can involve hundreds of different target audiences or groups and dozens of methods and strategies for approach. And as a new commercial real estate professional, you have to make some choices. You can use a shotgun approach to prospecting by attacking each and every different property type and different market, hoping to generate some deals, or you can narrow your focus. It, far, it makes far more sense to select a target audience and method of approach to that target audience that fits with your knowledge, your personality, your background, and your comfort zone. And a target audience might be owners of office buildings or owners of shopping centers or even farmers with land to develop. Presentation, the second part of the owner side of the transaction, includes several components as well. You're going to need to make an effective presentation to the potential client, of course, but you'll also have to evaluate the marketability and potential sales or lease price of a property or a business. And further, you're going to need to handle objections the owner is going to raise during your presentation and your analysis of the property. And keep in mind that every owner thinks their property or their business is better than every other owner's property. And the final piece in the landlord or, or seller puzzle is delivering service to that property owner. And service includes maintaining ongoing communication until that property is sold or leased creating a specific targeted marketing plan for the property, and providing feedback from potential buyers and tenants to the property. That service component will also include negotiating a contract in your client's best interest. Now, the buyer or tenant side is almost a mirror of the owner side. A prospective buyer or prospective tenant needs to be located, shown why they should work with you, and then be taken care of, be serviced. On the owner's side of the transaction, a commercial realtor might advertise to promote their listings and attract buyers or tenants, and we advertise differently than we do in residential. Your goal, however, is to either identify and find prospective buyers or tenants, or to handle those incoming inquiries and convert them to buyers or tenants who will work with you to find the perfect location. Unfortunately, most realtors only convert a small percentage of incoming calls into clients. So using careful techniques to determine the buyer or tenant's wants and needs can go a long way to converting a larger percentage of calls into clients. A buyer or tenant presentation includes pre-qualifying the potential client to determine if their wants and needs are in line with their ability to finance. There's little worse than wasting a few weeks of time finding that perfect location for a client only to discover that that client can't really afford that location. 
A presentation to a buyer also needs to include a discussion of buyer agency or tenant representation and why buyer agency or tenant representation is really in their best interest. And then the last component of working with buyers or tenants is to provide the service that they need. And that service component is going to include showing properties, analyzing each location, and determining the value of possible locations to the buyer or tenant. And then there's the sale. After finally putting together a sale, just like on the residential side of the transaction, it involves writing an offer for the buyer, pre presenting an offer to the seller, and as a real estate professional, You'll have to negotiate any agreement in your client's best interest. And additionally, if an agreement or lease is contingent upon commercial financing or zoning approvals or reviewing the accounting for the property or business or environmental inspections, your job is going to be to assist in coordinating all the players involved in the transaction and possibly renegotiating the deal depending on the outcome of inspections or zoning approvals. So let me start by introducing you to what we talked about in the beginning today, which is prospecting. So it was February 11th. I was in my mid-20s without a date for Valentine's Day. I know it's hard to believe, but I'd recently broken up with a longtime girlfriend and wasn't sure what to do next. So I went to the local florist and I ordered a dozen roses. I then asked the florist to send one rose to each of 12 different young women I'd selected. The florist looked at me and said, you're kidding, right? I wasn't. That's called prospecting. We need to select the target audience and let them know you have something to offer them. Of course, in those days, I was much younger and thinner. In the commercial real estate industry, as in most sales professions, prospecting is a dirty word. Far too many realtors enter the field of real estate believing they can wait for that phone to ring and earn an above average income if only they select the right brokerage with great advertising. Most new agents, as they venture into this endeavor, expect that the company will generate leads for them. And while it's true that most good real estate organizations generate some customers from advertising, marketing programs, and reputation, you will not make a great living at any company waiting for the phone to ring. Century 21 is the number one name in real estate worldwide. It's the most recognized brand in the industry. But if you sit around the office all day waiting for clients to show up, you will fail. Prospecting, however, is not simply picking up the phone and calling possible buyers, sellers, tenants, and landlords. To be effective, prospecting needs to be a consistent plan process. Your goal is to create a steady flow of business into your pipeline that are, will, will result in an above average income. And your business will build like a wave over the long term of your career if you deliver exceptional star, service. Starting small, your business can grow to tsunami proportions as more and more of your past clients, your business associates, your friends, relatives, and so on, refer business to you. But it's a process to create those referrals, and you've got to survive long enough in the industry making a living until you have a database of people who like and trust you that will continually feed and expand your business and your client base. So there are true, two fundamental truths about prospecting. The first truth is that you must prospect consistently to be successful. Set aside time each and every week to perform the task because if you don't block out time, other stuff is going to get in the way. Well, Lauren, I couldn't prospect today because I really needed to go shopping for groceries and I had an out-of-town client that threw off my schedule and I had this awful hangnail. My experience with speaking in front of and training thousands of realtors across the country and the world over the years has taught me that prospecting is the hardest part of any real estate career. The number one reason that realtors fail in the industry is they fail to schedule time to find prospects. This is particularly important early in a realtor's career. In the long run, realtors who deliver exceptional service receive many referrals from their clients, which means that you, as a successful agent or broker, can shift your focus from finding new business to nurturing your existing relationships and providing value to your customers. However, when you're building a real estate business for yourself, you need to look at the various options available to seek out qualified property sellers, buyers, investors, and tenants. And the second truth about prospecting is it's a process, not an event. See, some real estate trainers teach realtors to randomly pick up the phone and call people until they get an appointment. Does that work, by the way? Absolutely it does. But a much smarter way or a much smarter approach might be to carefully select the target market that you feel is not being serviced or where you might find a competitive advantage and lay out a game plan to target that audience. 
And that game plan will include a method or several methods of contacting that target audience, a reason for your contact or something of value for that group you're prospecting, and a systematic way to follow up with that group. Now the four steps to a successful prospecting system are on the screen. Number one is to select a target market. Number two is to select a method of contact. Number three is to give your prospect something of value. And don't worry, we're going to go through each of these. And number four is to follow up consistently. So let's start with selecting a target market. When I opened my first real estate office in eastern Pennsylvania, about 90 minutes outside of Manhattan, I was competing with a huge company that advertised that their firm was involved in one out of every four sales in my marketplace. They were, there were many real estate companies and offices, but one stood out as a giant that we all had to compete against. And this huge independent real estate firm, which we'll refer to as M, had hundreds of agents, their own real estate television show, and marketing brochures that I couldn't possibly afford to produce. So since I was too small to compete head-to-head -head with such a behemoth, I dusted off my copy of the book Marketing Warfare by Reese and Trout, a book I highly recommend. And I went to work on guerrilla tactics for building market share. Reese and Trout explained that a small company or a small team should find niche markets. Clients like specialists or someone who understands their particular market. And a particular market can be a type of property, it can be a particular area, or it can be a combination of both. So we searched to find areas of real estate specialization that appeared to be ignored by larger companies. And one of our earliest target audiences was commercial farms and equine businesses. We're only 90 minutes from Manhattan, but there are commercial equine businesses. In order to develop this market, we began compiling a list of all the existing commercial farms or equine businesses and all the properties that were suitable to develop into a commercial farm. And sadly, this was before the days of Internet databases. So we designed marketing pieces with a message that offered something of value, which was free information. We created a specific newsletter that we mailed to that group that had information on property values, maximizing returns, and other articles that owners of this type of property might find useful. We found that these newsletters had a much longer shelf life because owners would hold on to them and we'd receive more calls from this group over time. Next, we started setting up free workshops that would be of value to our target audience. And finally, we sent announcements to the press explaining that we were the commercial farm experts. And as the World Wide Web came online, we created several websites specifically targeted at horse farm buyers and sellers. And you'll still find many of my articles on buying and selling farms all over the web today. We repeated this program of targeting specific groups and creating marketing plans specifically designed to their needs with gas stations, with restaurants, with liquor licenses, with bank foreclosure departments, with investment properties, and many other target groups we selected. And by the time we completed our fifth or sixth target market, we had market share in virtually every part of our market area. Depending on your market, you may select office buildings or a particular office park. You might select retail properties or shopping centers or gas stations or target audience or any target audience. It's critical to carefully select the group you plan to work with and build a business to the needs of the clients. And some of the agents we work with, by the way, sell anything from commercial farms like you saw in the beginning to skyscrapers and shopping malls and large development projects and everything in between. So start by selecting a broad group. Are you looking to get into sales or leasing? Are you looking to work on office buildings or retail space or hotels or land development? Select an initial specialization that you can target. And then you might want to narrow that focus to an audience that might not be well serviced or well represented in the marketplace. Maybe you want to hit healthcare tenant representation or look for just high retail high growth chains. And by the way, there are some Central 21 agents across the country targeting that uh, demographic and try to represent them in your market. There are literally dozens of different target groups and campaigns you can run to try to develop clients. Expired listings, commercial for sale by owners, and there are plenty of those, aren't there? Pension funds who invest in real estate, working with your local of chamber of commerce, joining a LATIP group, or going after attorney referrals or bank foreclosure specialists. There are lots and lots of target audiences. And once you decide on a target audience, how do you get in touch with them? Our next step is method of contact, but you have to find the customer before you can get in front of them. And unfortunately, 
Many business people or commercial property owners hold properties in an LLC rather than in their personal name. So first you identify the properties that meet your target audience. For example, if you're going to specialize in flexible office space and several office parks in your area, first you have to find addresses for each building in the park. Then you have to get the tax records to find out who's listed as the owner, which is often an LLC. And then you've got to search the LLC database to find the person who's the actual owner. Or you could simply pick up the phone, call the business and say, hey, who owns the place? Then you have to get the phone number or the email address of that person if possible. Then you have to call them and then you have to put them into your contact management software. And by the way, if you're not using contact management software, you need to be. You've got to set one up and you've got to create a system to follow up with people. We'll be talking about that over the next two sessions. Another software package that might help you search more easily for prospects is an online service you can subscribe to called Prospect Now. It combines information from dozens of different databases and allows you to search areas for properties that are in your market area and market type and then automatically find the owner's name and contact information rather than going through 15 steps. It's a great service and it's fairly reasonably priced. So this is what a search looks like on the service. And this is what it comes out looking like. Across the bottom of the screen, you'll see the uh, contact information or the uh, list of properties that meet the criteria that we're looking for in a particular area. And then as you click on each one, it gives you more information on the owner, the LLC, who the actual owner is, up in the upper right-hand window there. Now, step one was to select the target market. Step two is to select your method of contacting that group. And again, there are literally hundreds of methods of contacting prospective buyers and sellers in your marketplace. Methods may include phone calls, door knocking, emailing, mailing, and some more creative methods like promotional products. You can actually get quite imaginative with your method of contact. For example, one of our associates that we mentor delivered large boxes to offices in a particular geographic area. When someone would open the box, three helium-filled balloons would fly out with his card and a note attached saying that uh, when you need the best commercial marketing team in the area, uh, pick the one that floats above the rest or whatever you want to use. And you can use that with Century 21. Just make sure the balloons are black and gold. In the beginning of your career, you need to proactively find sources of leads for sellers, buyers, investors, landlords, and tenants. And there are three forms of finding business in real estate. They're what I call hope for it, wait for it, or go get it. Hope for it, which is reactive prospecting, is basically waiting in the office on floor time or opportunity time for that phone to ring so you can pick up a client. Again, you're never going to become rich waiting for the phone to ring. You'll be at the mercy of the market. You know, every real estate office, every real estate company has a superstar there, maybe a couple of them. And every real estate office or every real estate company has some people that are floundering or failing. It's the difference between what the agent puts into the, their career rather than what the office offers. So that's hoping for business. The second is waiting for it, proactive long-term marketing. Long-term marketing is generally another passive form of seeking clients. Uh, sending out mailers or postcards and similar methods generally produce very few immediate clients. Regularly mailing to organizations or individuals who are likely to buy, sell, or expand in the future may bring business to an agent in the future. Joining referral or community organizations and promoting yourself regularly may bring future business as well. It does work, but it takes time. And then the last one is... Go get it. Proactive short-term prospecting and marketing. An agent who's out in the marketplace actively seeking companies or individuals who need their assistance right now is proactively short-term prospecting. And we're going to go through some examples of all three of these methods. So one of the great aspects of working in the real estate industry is that you can create your own business within a business without the overhead of running your own company. This is an industry where you'll need inventory in order to survive, and your inventory is your portfolio of properties for sale or for lease. However, unlike most small businesses, you don't have to pay the carrying cost of buying that inventory or purchasing that inventory and putting it on a shelf. You're effectively marketing someone else's product and being paid for that service. And you may have some carrying costs with paying for LoopNet, but overall it's a lot less expensive than opening a business. So in the beginning of your real estate career, unless you're independently wealthy, you're going to need to find clients who need to buy, sell, or lease right now. 
And finding clients who need to buy, sell, or lease right now is proactive short-term prospecting. And that might mean sitting down and calling every property owner along Main Street in your city or every business in an industrial park to find out if they're considering expanding or moving or selling. It might mean stopping by every business in several office buildings to meet the owners and ask if they need assistance in their growth plans. Knowing that you're probably going to have to go out and make cold calls or knock on doors is a hard pill to swallow for most new agents. However, you won't have to do it forever. You are building a business for the long haul. And as you treat these clients with professionalism, honesty, and give them 100%, they're going to refer business to you and your personal business is going to grow. So I'm going to run through a few long-term methods of contact. I'm going to start with door knocking or farming for listings. And I get a chuckle sometimes when I say this in, in a, an auditorium. But the most commonly discussed long-term method of prospecting is farming. And a farm can be a geographic area, such as an office park or a particular area in town. It can be a property type, such as office or retail or industrial or hotels. It can be a business type, such as gas stations or assisted living facilities. The downside to farming is that you'll probably need to contact the same group of businesses or individuals over and over and over until they begin to recognize you. And it might take a year, it might take 18 months to actually see any results from your work. But the upside to farming is that once you become known as a specialist in that area or that property type, it becomes very difficult for another realtor to unseat you. Again, one of my primary specialties in early in my career was commercial horse farms. I had chosen that type of property as one that I thought was being ignored by established real estate brokers. I began mailing continually to that group, showing up at equestrian events, developed websites, published a newspaper about commercial horse farms. And over time, I took over that market because I was the specialist who really understood that market. So when you're farming, first you've got to select a target audience for your message. And again, are you planning to pursue any type of commercial property or are you planning to specialize? And once you've determined a direction, you have to identify everyone who owns that type of property and try and contact them and start to build a relationship with them. So start with that geographic region that you'll be working within. Then identify those properties that fit your specialization category and finally identify who owns the property so you can effectively begin to direct your efforts at the owners. And obviously, farming may uh, uh, doesn't have to be limited to seeking listings to represent. Some real estate professionals work tenants in a geographic area to represent them when they're moving to larger or smaller space or purchasing space. One of our students made a solid income by simply stopping repeatedly at all of the tenant-occupied space in one office park and reminding those tenants that she was the person to call to find the perfect new space when they moved. Other realtors will specialize in working with investors by contacting all property owners that have an investment real estate in their market, hoping to find them additional properties to purchase. You might also try holding workshops or events. A great source of business can be created by marketing yourself as a local expert in each market. And one of the best ways to set yourself apart as the expert is to hold workshops on subjects that would interest your target audience. And while you're hosting that workshop, you're immediately seen as the expert in the field. For example, if you're already mailing to everybody who owns a restaurant with a liquor license, you can create a mailing announcing an upcoming workshop on issues related to selling or related to financing restaurants or liquor licenses. If you're concentrating specifically on selling commercial investments, like multi-user office buildings or retail strip centers, you might want to target doctors groups or attorneys groups and other possible investors. Contact the local hospital to set up a workshop in the hospital for employees on how to invest in commercial real estate or how to leverage your assets to increase your investment portfolio or how to avoid mistakes when leasing or how to find great tenants for your commercial property. You might even find a commercial mortgage broker who will be willing to split the cost of the event with you. And then, of course, there is cold calling. Sadly, no matter what kind of marketing we teach, a large percentage of the best commercial properties will never, ever, ever, ever hit the open market. They will sell directly from one client to another. They will use a realtor in many cases, but that realtor will never have to put the property on the market. The best net leased properties, the best hotels, the hottest high traffic corners, 
never make it on the open market. Why? Because there are agents who build databases of clients looking for certain property types, like net leased properties, or shopping centers, or hotels, and they regularly call on the owners of that type of property that are for sale. There are also companies and investors that have site location staff that do the same thing. How could it be that some agent down the street that you've never seen at a Board of Realtors function, never seen in the MLS, just sold a hotel down the street for 15 or $20 million? It's because they have a database of potential buyers and are regularly contacting the owners of properties that meet their buyers or investor needs. You could do the same thing. But if you're trying to farm an office park or shopping center and you want to be able to actually speak with the decision makers in the LLC, you're going to have to get past someone. That someone is someone we call the gatekeeper. Let me explain. If you're the broker of your company, you might receive those calls trying to sell you copier toner or a new electricity contract or light bulbs or pens or whatever. You might even have a receptionist who's trained to try and block those calls on your behalf. I do that as well. And most large companies or LLCs have some sort of gatekeeper that try and keep you from bothering the boss. If you've ever seen the book Harvey McKay's Swim with the Sharks, Harvey owned a premier, the premier envelope manufacturing company in the country. And he talks in his book about getting past the gatekeeper with what he uses as the 300-second strategy. I love it so much that I use it regularly. And here's how it works. You've got to build a relationship with the receptionist or the owner's assistant or admin first. You have to acknowledge their significant role in reaching the boss, and ultimately you've got to make a deal with them. Hi, Trudy. I know your job is to keep people like me from talking with people like your boss. And I know, unlike everyone else who calls him, I just want to meet him and I want to introduce myself to him. I don't want to waste his time. So here's my best pitch. I'd like you to find five minutes in his schedule so I can introduce myself. I mean that. Five minutes. 300 seconds and only 300 seconds. So here's what I'm going to do. I want to stop in and hand you a stopwatch. If I take one second over 300 to introduce myself, I will give you a check for $100 that you can send to your favorite charity. By the way, what's your favorite charity? This often makes them laugh, and it's one of the ways that gatekeepers will open the door. And if you do get in to introduce yourself, please make sure to keep it to three or four minutes and just introduce yourself. Follow up with a handwritten thank you note to the gatekeeper and include a $20 check to their favorite charity anyway, because you're going to be remembered. You can also try working uh, a networking organization like a LATIP or a BNI. These are great sources of leads. They're networking organizations like the Chamber of Commerce, but they're national. And in each lo local chapter, they only allow one person in from each business category. So, for example, there can only be one chiropractor, one heating and air conditioning vendor, one payroll specialist, and, of course, one commercial realtor. Each member of the group tries to help every other member of the group to grow their business. Members are encouraged to tip other members with possible leads. These types of groups can help multiply your efforts to get your name out in front of potential clients. And additionally, each person in a LATIP group is probably a decision maker in their business, and they may be potential buyers and sellers for you in time. Well, what about social media, Lauren? Well, certainly you can build connections with people who already like and trust you and then utilize social media tools to tap into the sphere of influence of everyone in your sphere of influence. But that's a whole half-day workshop by itself. And we'll be covering a couple of different ideas on social media over the next couple of sessions. And, of course, you can do trade shows, attend or host business mixers, and have client gatherings. But remember that you need to create a steady flow of referrals in order to keep your business going. And you need to survive long enough to create that flow of referrals. Real estate's a relationship game. The stronger your relationships, the more referrals you'll generate and the stronger bonds you'll make. Don't fall into that trap of selling a property and neglecting the client after the sale because your clients can be your strongest advocates in the industry. One of the top agents uh, that we've worked with started doing a summer picnic at her home for friends and clients the first year she was in business. She expressed that it's one of the greatest things she does for her business. Not only does she have fun and enjoy the company of her clients away from business, but her phone rings with referrals after every client gathering. And she's now started doing a winter wine and cheese get-together as well so that she touches the group twice a year. So at this point, 
I usually get that question. You know what it is. But Laura and my new agent start. Can't I just start mailing brochures and postcards and stuff to the owners of businesses? Won't that work? I'm going to give you some examples today of some successful mailing campaigns. But, and I want to stress this, our experience is that if you mail huge volumes of material out to prospective clients, you may get some prospects, but not many. Think of all the junk mail you get at your home or at your office. Many people open their mail directly over the garbage can so they can immediately dump anything that looks like a sales piece. In fact, our return on blind mailers to people we don't already have a relationship with is about one-tenth of one percent. So, if you mail to a thousand prospective clients, one might contact you. And a contact does not mean they're going to use your service. So as with any marketing or advertising, if you mail consistently over and over and over to the same group, they're eventually going to begin to recognize your name and services. But again, that might take a year to 18 months to start generating a possible business. And most agents can't survive a year and a half without income. And most new agents who use mailers give up before it is time to work. But if you absolutely must mail, then we have to create a mailing piece that's going to get attention. And there are two ways to do that. The first is to give the prospect something of value, which we're going to talk about in a couple of minutes. The second is to send a postcard or a mailer with a headline that evokes an emotional response. See, our goal is to get someone to actually read our message. How do we attract someone to read a message when they're inundated by marketing and advertising messages every day? Just go onto any news feed. Look at everything that shows up on your screen. Look at every advertising message you see on billboards and everywhere that you look. However, have you ever been stuck in the express lane of the grocery store? You know, behind somebody who has 37 items, even though the sign clearly reads, it's a maximum of 12 items. What do they think they're doing? Well, your eye is naturally drawn to that crazy headline in the National Enquirer or some other tabloid about the baby who just graduated college or the secret alien attack in San Francisco. The headline makes you read further. And here are some of the great tabloid headlines I've seen recently. Human skeleton found on the moon. Um, World's smartest ape goes to college. Nine-month-old baby gets a black belt in karate. Computer virus that infects people. And one of my all-time favorites, how to buy a $450,000 home for only $750,000. That was obviously in San Francisco. Now, I'm not suggesting that you use tabloid headlines like these, but I am suggesting that you create some sort of headline that entices the reader to read the rest of your postcard or the rest of your message. So, for example, did you hear what happened to the landlord on 15th Street last night? It can happen to you next. And the back of the card might say something like, the landlord sold their apartment complex for a great price in a reasonable period of time because they called Century 21. And if you want your apartment building sold, call Barbara at Century 21. How about the owner of the shopping center next door got exactly what he deserved last night and you can be next? Well, this would be a simple card we send out to the owners of shopping centers. And the back would say the owner just leased two more storefronts that had sat empty for months because of the efforts of the retail team at Century 21 who took over the contract. Do you know what Bradley Accounting did last night? The answer might shock you. And again, on the back, Bradley Accounting was able to find a new location for their business at a better lease rate with more space because they hired Century 21 as their tenant representation representative. Will these headlines attract more attention than just sold cards or just leased cards? Certainly. You could do professional business cards or postcards as well. But will the same number of people read it? It's always your choice what you want to do. And that leads us to the third step in our process. First was to select a target market. Second was to select a method of contact. And third is to give that prospect something of value. Where many realtors fall short in prospecting is failing to give the, something of value to the person they're trying to contact. Our goal when prospecting is not just to sell a property. Many agents have a difficult time understanding the concept. But the primary goal of prospecting is to identify potential clients. Out of the gazillions of commercial property owners and tenants in your market area, you want to entice some of them to raise their hand and acknowledge that they may be in the market to buy, sell, or invest sometime in the near future. We have to create some call to action so we can identify those who are likely to buy or sell. For example, a small business owner in a marketplace 
may be interested in moving out of his lease space to purchase a small office or a retail property along a particularly busy road, but they might not be quite ready or able to buy. So even if you advertise the perfect sized property along the perfect street right now today, that business owner might not react and call you because he or she is not quite ready to buy. So how do we get future clients to raise their hands and identify themselves? What you want to find out is who is going to be buying or selling over the next few months or next few years and direct your efforts, your future mailings and, the, and your efforts at those individuals. And one of the methods of enticing buyers, sellers, and tenants to raise their hands and let you know that they will be in the market shortly is to give them something they consider to be valuable. And usually that something is information. That type of marketing is called direct response marketing. The realtor in this case builds an advertisement with an eye-catching headline that causes the reader to go beyond the headline and look at the offer. The body of the ad then creates a compelling offer for some information that the prospective buyer or seller simply has to have. These offers might be based around a fear of loss, a possibility of gain, or a strong curiosity about a subject. And that free information might be recent sales or leasing data on the market. It might be industry information like cap rates or returns in, in the market, or it might be free informational booklets. Many large commercial firms use free informational booklets on the market as their call to action. Investors want to know what today's cap rates are in a particular market, or how many or how quickly properties are selling, or what rates properties are leasing at. Rather than using a sales piece that will put up the client's defenses, a consumer can view you as a valuable partner in the process of buying and selling rather than a salesperson. Understanding how to attract prospective buyers, sellers, and investors to call you is both a science and an art form. You have to start by considering what the prospective client desires and needs, and just as important, what they will actively avoid. Think of it from their perspective. For example, in most cases, buyers and tenants don't really want to talk to us. They're afraid of being sold or of someone trying to talk them into making a decision that they're not prepared to make. What they really want is information. So think of their needs and their desires first. And next, try to put those needs and desires into a strong headline that'll tempt the consumer to read the rest of the article or advertisement. Local couple mauled by lion while buying an investment property or local office building haunted by Victoria's Secret model, will be available for a lease shortly, might cause a potential client to read the article but wouldn't fit the category of filling their needs or desires. And a property owner who's considering selling might not respond to call for a free real estate market analysis, but they might instead call for a free informational booklet, the 22 critical steps to selling your commercial building downtown. There has to be something that tweaks that prospective client's interest and leads them to call you. And likewise, a prospective tenant or buyer may not respond to call to learn about buyer agency or pre-qualify for a commercial loan, but they might respond to a free informational booklet, The Seven Deadly Mistakes Made by Retail Tenants That Cost Them Thousands. Or a retail tenant might respond to The Eleven Secrets of Negotiating a Retail Build-Out with a Landlord. But to be effective, you have to find a message that is going to resonate with your potential customers and use that message to identify future buyers, sellers, and tenants in order to grow your business. And when you provide the client with valuable information, you become the expert. You're not just selling, but you're giving advice. And this is one of the reasons so many successful agents do video online. But again, you have to get a way to identify that client first before sending them the video or sending them the report so that we know who we can direct our efforts at. So let's talk about creating a report. The question I most often ask is, where do we get these free reports? Well, I can sell them to you, but honestly, you have to create them. You're going to put together a few 3 to 10 page pamphlets that succinctly answer the question you advertise in the article. Or if you do it by video, you have to create a short video answering those questions. And unfortunately, this is where I tend to lose most agents unless I provide them with copies of the informational pamphlets. Because the task of actually writing three or four pages of a pamphlet seems to be too daunting for most agents. The truth, however, is that it's relatively easy to write a pamphlet and it's good practice to determine what's really beneficial to a potential client. For example, 
you might advertise that investors make many mistakes when they start investing in real estate that cost them thousands of dollars. That's a true statement, isn't it? Investors don't take the time to legally protect themselves from tenants. They don't create LLCs. They hire the wrong mortgage company that gouges them on fees. They neglect to have property inspections because they want to save money or because they think they know everything because they have a background in construction, and they end up with significant problems that they didn't anticipate. They buy for a higher return, but they find that they've bought in a high crime area, and they're sorry later. So can you take a few minutes and write down the mistakes you've seen investors make? What about commercial tenants? Have they made mistakes? What about the owners of property? Write down whatever mistakes you can think of, then have lunch with a few other agents and share ideas of what mistakes your clients have made and their clients have made. And take that list, number the mistakes one through whatever, and write a short three to four sentence description of what each mistake means, why it costs investors or commercial tenants or owners money, and how to avoid that mistake. And ta-da! You've got a free report that you can advertise online, or you can turn it into a video. You can also put these free reports on the internet. Websites are really marketing, advertising, and informational vehicles. And for those of you who have a website that simply says, Rebecca sells Denver commercial real estate, and has a glamour shot of you, you really need to rethink your online strategy. Again, nobody's going to call Rebecca to buy or sell from a simple ad saying Rebecca sells Denver commercial real estate. And if they do, I would question their motives. When you add your properties to, for sale to a site, you pick up a little bit of response. But you typically won't get a tremendous response because most buyers know they can go to LoopNet or Property Line or Commercial Search or another large site to find everybody's listings. Free reports give you one more way of keeping your site sticky. And that means that you attract visitors to come back over and over again. But remember, we need to find a way of enticing clients to identify themselves. That's why video alone isn't as powerful as getting people to identify themselves first. So there are two keys to make this work. First, we've got to give enough information that the client simply has to have a copy of the report. And second, don't give it to them unless we get some information from them. They should fill out an online form in order to receive their copy of their report. And this information is critical because part of the process of prospecting is to identify the potential clients so you can set up a system to regularly contact those clients. And your online form should include some contact information, such as name or address or phone number and email address, and give them the option to let you know if they want to buy, sell, invest, or lease, and when. And our final step is follow-up systems. Once you've identified potential future clients, you need to begin building a relationship with them. And in general, relationships are based on individuals like and trusting one another. It's really tough to make somebody like and trust you simply by mailing stuff to them. However, you can build a relationship that provides value to the prospective client. Continue to give the prospect good information in small increments. Drip on them and provide them with the opportunity to respond to the information or request more. And additionally, humor can be part of any follow-up campaign. Humor may not make the potential client think of you as the best, most knowledgeable person in the world, but it might humanize you and help the client to like and remember you. A successful follow-up campaign uses a variety of techniques and contact methods and integrates both online and offline strategies. At Century 21, you have some of the best tools available, and they're free. Let me repeat, they are free. Put every contact you have into 21 Online, into Business Builder, and at least begin sending them newsletters and holiday greetings. I would really prefer if you start sending them valuable information that keeps leading them back to your website over and over again. But at least start somewhere. In the long run, I'd like you to include video clips that humanizes you as well in everything you send out. But again, start somewhere. Now, we've talked about selecting a target market. We've talked about selecting methods of contact, giving your prospects something of value, and starting a follow-up campaign. So let's spend a few minutes going through some prospecting campaigns to create some business. Because let's be honest, you need business now. I'm going to start with short-term prospecting methods. Earlier, I talked about short-term prospecting methods versus long-term. When you work on long-term methods, you're going to be more effective at building lasting, sometimes lifelong relationships with clients that can help your career to blossom as long as you continue to deliver good service to your customers. However, in order to stay in the business long enough for those long-term methods to work, 
you'll need to generate some income by creating some short-term business. You'll need to make it a priority to find buyers, sellers, investors, or tenants who want to buy, sell, or lease right now. If you don't, in six or seven months, your spouse is going to be telling you that you better go out and get, yes, you guessed it, a real job. So short-term systems include prospecting expired listings, uh, properties and businesses for sale by owner, and just playing cold calling or door knocking to find people or businesses that need to move. I'm going to start with some shot in the dark cold calling. Again, we talked about cold calling earlier, and I realize it's absolutely the most avoided activity in the real estate industry. However, if you don't have a large book of business currently, including lots of listings and a regular stream of buyers, investors, and prospective tenants knocking your door down, you need to start building a career somewhere. So select a few target markets and create a reason to contact them. For example, your firm may have recently leased a vacant office space in an industrial park. Ask the listing associate if they'd mind if you'd prospect that industrial park for other units to lease. Then make a list of all the buildings around the firm's recent contract and locate the owner's phone numbers. No, I didn't say locate their mailing address. Remember that most mail is going to be thrown out without ever being opened. And in order for you to survive in this industry, you need to find business now. So pick up the phone and start calling the owners or decision makers of surrounding properties. Hi, Mr. Dumbledore. This is Ron Weasley calling from Century 21 Hogwarts Commercial Realty. We are wizards at getting office buildings leased. I'm calling because we recently leased a space in a neighboring building to yours, and we found a lot of prospective clients, a lot of prospective tenants, while we were marketing in that space. And I'm just calling to see if you know anybody else in the park that might be considering leasing or selling some of their space. Now, if the person you're speaking with asks how much the space leased for, they may be considering leasing some of their own space. So make sure to follow up with a personal note card and thank them for being so pleasant on the phone. You might also try the simple and direct approach. Hi, Mr. Smith. This is Benjamin Franklin calling from Century 21 Kite and Key Commercial Realty. I'm trying to find properties for my firm to market, and I was just wondering if you were considering selling your building or if you needed assistance finding any tenants. One of our top agents in our firm had started cold calling right out of the starting gate. His first day in the Allentown office, he sat down and told me that he had four kids to feed, so he selected all the multifamily properties in just one zip code and called all of them. Hi, Mr. Luthor. My name is Clark Kent, and I am a real estate investor in the area. I'm actually also an investment property specialist here at Century 21 League of Heroes. I'm sorry to bother you, but I noticed that you own some properties near mine. I was wondering if you were considering adding to your portfolio by buying more properties, or if you were considering liquidating, selling off properties while the market's fairly hot. This was a strong approach because many investors are either planning to add more properties to their portfolios, or start selling off what they own. And using this script, our associate was able to find both property buyers and property sellers with one set of phone calls. And this cold calling technique helped him to jumpstart his career, and he sold over $4 million in real estate in only nine months from 30 days of cold calling, and his average sales price was around $100,000. Vacant property owners. There are investors who buy vacant land parcels in commercial and industrial areas because they want to develop them, but their plans change before construction. You're also going to discover investors who buy land for speculation and simply hold on to it till some future date. But in either case, these are very good prospective listings. So search your local tax records for vacant land that's zoned for commercial, industrial, office, or even multifamily uses. And call the owners and ask them if they're planning on building on that land or if they're planning on selling that land. Hi, Mr. Johnson. This is Peter Parker calling from Century 21 Webs and Swingers, hometown commercial realty. I came across your property on Oscorp Drive today and I was reach while I was researching other properties, and I was curious. Are you planning on building on that site, or are you planning on selling it? You know, a few years ago, I was asked to attend a meeting in Virginia. And on a whim, I looked up all the vacant land parcels in the part of Pennsylvania that my team was servicing that were owned by companies or individuals in Virginia. And I sent out a note to all of them announcing that I'd be in their area for a meeting. And if they were considering selling their property in Pennsylvania, I'd love to meet with them personally. I then followed up with phone calls. And ultimately, I scheduled seven listing appointments all over the eastern part of Virginia and left for Virginia two days early. I listed four of the properties in just over a day because the clients were pleased that I could meet with them in person. Let's switch over to commercial expired listings. 
That's another form of short-term prospecting. After all, we know they want to sell or lease, don't we? And we also know they've been unsuccessful so far. And expired listings can often be found in the MLS or by carefully tracking online databases like LoopNet to determine when a property vanishes from the system. Many of these properties are listed again with another real estate broker within days of the property being taken off the market. And most expired listings come back on the market within a year unless sellers' plans have changed or they're unrealistic about the price. Once a company or group decides to relocate, retire, or expand, they generally do. Even if they take off a few months in between realtors, they generally relist at some point. So calling or stopping by the owners of expired listings can be a quick method of capturing listings. And as with any other form of prospecting, make sure if you're going to target expired listings that you do it consistently. Don't simply take a hit or miss approach by calling the expired listing once in a while and expecting it to work. Consistency is the key to any long-term success. Now, I have a lot of methods of going after expireds, but I'll share a couple of them with you real quick. The first one is what I call the pre-crumpled letter strategy. As I mentioned earlier, the headline does 85% of the job of getting the message read. So when we're sending letters to expired listings, and this works for commercial for sale by owners as well, we often print a huge headline across the top third of the letter that says, this letter has been pre-crumpled for your convenience. The rest of the letter explains that selling a property requires making that property stand out from the competition. Mr. and Mrs. Seller, we are the best at getting our messages read, and we're the best at making your property stand out. And then we crumple up the letter, I'm not kidding, we flatten it back out, and we put it in the envelope and send it to the expired listing or the for sale by owner, hand addressed of course. It feels different because it crinkles so the client opens it, they get a chuckle, and hopefully we get our method message read. A second method is what I have referred to as the needle in the haystack box, which is a technique I stole from a husband and wife team in Toronto, Canada. Remember that our objective is to differentiate ourselves from other commercial realtors. So in my market area in Pennsylvania, it's relatively easy to find hay. We'd fill a small box with hay. You get cake boxes for about 32 cents a piece. We'd uh, next buy a package of large plastic needles that are sold at Walmart, Target, and other fine retailers. We'd punch a hole in our team business card and tie that plastic needle to the card with a piece of yarn. We bury the needle in the, you know, hay and place our card on top. And last, we'd close the box and seal it and writing across the top, finding a great commercial real estate team is like finding a needle in a haystack. That sounds a little corny, doesn't it? When the recipient opens the box, a card in, inside explains that there are three things that sell a property. First and foremost, it needs to be priced properly. Second, it needs to be in comparable or better condition than competing properties, or that condition needs to be reflected in the price. And finally, the marketing has to differentiate the property from others for sale and help it to stand out to prospective buyers, tenants, and investors. In fact, as a realtor in our market, there are 2,200 other realtors competing for the same properties. And I need to change what I do to make myself stand out and differentiate myself and my team. I can do that for myself, which I think I've proven, and I can do that for your property as well because you're competing against other properties as well. Another method is to create a quick personalized postcard on the property and send it to them. If you've got a good color printer and decent software, uh, you can print their property photo on the front of, uh, of a postcard with your headline, your for sale sign, and put on the back that we do more to market commercial property than anyone else, and you mail it to them. That might even be more than their last agent did for them. Commercial for sale by owners are another great source of business. After all, there are investors who think they can sell their properties on their own. There are attorneys who believe they don't need us. Uh, owners of strip malls who try and lease on their own. And what about small business owners who think they can save the commission themselves? In the interest of time, I'll just mention two quick methods. You can do that pre-crumpled letter uh, strategy, like I said, for expireds. And you can also create a for sale by owner survival package, which is basically a huge package of all the commercial forms and disclosures they might need and warnings about zoning issues and financing and so on that they might be a little scared and come back to you. Or we can call them and use the honest approach. Hey, you're probably trying to save the commission, but in case that doesn't work out for you, would you keep me in mind? Longer term methods of attracting clients like commercial farming which again is selecting a target audience, building a database, and contacting them regularly. 
And I'm going to stress when you're trying to farm an area, you need to use what we call a unique selling proposition to differentiate yourself from everyone else, but I'll come back to that in a few minutes. You can use postcards. You can do some humorous ones, like for your clients, we'd go 15 rounds with a champion, endure hideous torture, or do a National Geographic special. Or you can do professional-looking cards, of course. And some of the other things uh, that you'll see in your manual that we've given you is uh, including testimonial mailings and evidence of success mailings, and of course, some mailings with humor. You'll also see some information on using newsletters and e-newsletters in your manual. And then in our prospecting section of the manual, we also want to introduce you to the concept of using a unique selling proposition, or USP, to differentiate yourself. Because of time constraints in this program, I want you to go over that in your manual. But a USP is a technique to differentiate yourself from your competitors by setting yourself apart as the expert in a particular area or property type. You can select a niche, like office buildings or gas stations or hotels. You might want to be the office building specialist or the salon and spa specialist or the healthcare leasing specialist. You might even want to be the tattoo and body piercing specialist. You know, whatever. The second type of USP is providing a unique service, which means crafting a campaign around the emotional pot buttons of a group in a particular area. The third type is providing a guarantee. And that can be a service guarantee or a performance guarantee. And again, there's many different types of guarantees that we have in your manual. I'd like you to read through those and get ready for the exam at the end of this program. I want to skip ahead to one of the most important markets that you should consider. And that important market is going to be your sphere of influence. Now, you probably know at least 100 people that you see from time to time. You have family, friends, old acquaintances, former co-workers, college roommates, and even that doctor, dentist, hairdresser, and that creepy guy at the gym that you see on a regular basis. You may not realize it, but these people are the beginning of your client base. Well, maybe except that creepy guy at the gym. As your career grows, you'll add past clients, business associates, and new contacts that you'll generate into your client base, into your sphere of influence. Now, agents scoff at the idea that their 68-year-old Uncle Albert could possibly assist them in the listing or sale of a multi-million dollar office building or the lease of retail space. But the truth is that every person you know has their own internal database of people they connect with regularly. Over 20 years ago, I met a man who was living in a roach-infested tenement, and that man referred me to a client who owns several hundred investment properties in Pennsylvania. You will never know who you can connect with until you start asking for help from those around you. Also, you probably already know people who own commercial property or operate small businesses. You'll never know precisely when your Uncle Otto is going to sell a Scandinavian restaurant. And wouldn't you be crushed if Otto listed his business with x -Lax Realtors, you know, the ones who have diarrhea of the mouth, because he didn't remember that you were in real estate? Don't let that happen. Stay in front of your sphere of influence. And please, avoid saying, I don't need to send anything to my family and friends. They all know what I do. Because let's be honest, they really have no idea what you do. The truth is, as much as your Aunt Petunia likes you, at this point in your career, she's probably not going to refer you to her old high school boyfriend, who is now president of the local bank. Why? Because unfortunately, Aunt Petunia, like all your relatives and friends, remembers you from your prior career. She can't visualize you as a successful commercial realtor, and she doesn't want to hurt her present relationships by telling them about an unproven new realtor. And by the way, because she's close to you, she remembers all the dumb things you've done in your life, and she's afraid of referring you. And it's not like Aunt Petunia and Uncle Albert don't love you. They really do. But they're afraid that you as a new commercial realtor might make a mistake, and that mistake will come back to haunt them. So one of the most successful techniques I've taught is to assist agents in appearing successful before they actually are successful. And that technique involves keeping you in front of your sphere of influence, your social network, but also showing your sphere of influence of evidence of production. And by the way, I want to add one more thing here. As much as you might think, because you talk about being in real estate, that your family and friends know you're in real estate, think about this. Do you know what every one of your nieces and nephews does for a career right now? Think about it. Now think about all your high school friends that you do run into from time to time. Do you remember where they work? What exactly they do? 
you know, they don't remember what you do either. So you've got to find a way to keep yourself in front of them and show them some evidence of your production. So to start with, you're going to have to create a database, a contact management database, of all those people you have some contact with. You've got to collect all the names, addresses, phone numbers, and email addresses for everyone that knows you and enter that information into your contact management software. And remember, 21 Online is free and free is good. If you want to use a specialty CRM for commercial real estate, Realnex, R-E-A-L-N-E-X, has a great software package. You can use ACT. Uh, CRE or APTO, all of those are on the screen. When you're brand new in the industry, the first step is to announce that you've entered the exciting world of real estate. And the second step is to convince that your social network, your sphere of influence, that you are the go-to person for anybody who needs assistance. When I'm training brand new agents, I recommend that during the first 90 days in business, you contact that sphere of influence at least six times or about once every two weeks. After that initial 90 days, you should continue to follow up with your sphere at least once a month, if, you, if not more. Now, you want to send them an initial letter, and that initial letter should be simple and to the point. For example, Dear Aunt Petunia, as you may know, I've made a career change. I'm now a licensed commercial real estate agent, and I've affiliated with one of the top firms in eastern Pennsylvania, Century 21 Commercial and Investment Realtors. In order to obtain my license, I had to complete several courses and pass a state exam. I took this education over the past few months. To join Century 21, I've had to take a lot of additional education, but I think it's all been worth it. Real estate is an exciting business. I'm hoping that you'll support me in my new endeavor. If you hear of anyone thinking of buying or selling property, please call me. I'll include a few of my business cards with this letter. Please put them in your wallet or purse and give them to anyone you can. And remember, although I may be new to the industry, I have had a lot of education and training, and I'm backed by some of the top commercial people here at Century 21. Thanks. Now, they might see this and think that's interesting and throw it away. So your second letter should so, show some evidence that you're actually working to sell properties. And honestly, by your second or third week in the industry, it's not real likely that you're going to have a lot of listings. So you may need to borrow some. You're going to send out a flyer that displays two or three different properties for sale in different price ranges with your name and company name at the bottom of the flyer. And as you'll see on the screen, you don't actually say anywhere that they're your listings, but your sphere of influence is going to assume they are, and their impression of you will hopefully shift. The reaction you're looking for is, wow, John seems to be doing really well after only a few weeks in real estate, which is kind of strange because your name isn't John. Ask around your office to find out if anyone would mind if you send copies of other agents' listings with your name on them to your clients. It's really rare that an agent is going to tell you they don't want you to expose their property to a few hundred people in your database. You might even take a few of these listings and post them on Facebook. Along with a message, know anyone thinking of investing in multifamily property? Please call me. Or know anybody looking to lease office or retail space? Please call me. And then your next step in the process is to begin sending personal notes to everybody you know. Purchase a few boxes of blank note cards from your local office supply store and set up a time each morning to write five to ten personal handwritten notes. If you send out five notes each day, you're going to hit 100 people in your database in just 20 work days. I'm not kidding. Your goal is to let them know you're thinking of them and personally ask for assistance. And you know, you might think that's corny also, but one of the amazing things I've discovered of top agents across the country, and by the way, I've dealt with agents that have sold over a billion dollars, that's billion with a B, in real estate. Top agents across the country, one thing they have in common is almost all of them follow a regimen of sitting down every morning between 7.30 and 9.00 and writing out somewhere between 3 and 20 personal handwritten notes. And in this day of iPhones and Droids and Facebook, personal notes really connect and resonate with people. If you plan on continuing the practice after your initial 20 days, that's great. You may have to really think hard of who you want to write a note to each day, but it's going to keep you in the forefront of many people's minds. And about two weeks after sending the initial flyer with three properties for sale, you should try sending a similar one that is three sold properties. And the headline might read, Successful Sales by Our Team. And the tagline on the bottom of the flyer might say, If you know of anyone thinking of selling commercial or investment real estate, please have them contact me. Again, even though you're honestly telling people that your firm or your team sold properties, your social network, your sphere of influence is going to naturally read that to say, 
you just sold three commercial properties. And it's going to lead your family and friends to talking about how well you're doing in such a short period of time. Again, your entire goal is to convince them that you're the person to refer, and this is typically going to do it. Build on that initial letter with similar marketing pieces over the first year and keep in constant contact with this group and add to the group continually as you meet new people. And as part of your campaign to remind your sphere of influence of your real estate career, make sure you join Facebook and other social media sites and connect, reach out to your family and friends and use carefully planned posts to plant seeds in their minds. I met a great client today who's looking to invest in multifamily properties, and I'll be showing him a few great deals this weekend. Please wish me luck. There are lots of ways to connect with this group, and you have to make sure you do it. That's what we've got for today. The next segment is going to be on presentation. And I want to stress that the next section on presentation is going to help you to go to every client appointment and win that client appointment. I hope to see you in the next program.